I don't know if you read our front sign when you drove in this morning, but in case you missed it, grace is not opposed to effort, but to what? Earning. And by grace, I'm referring to God's free provision through Christ for our every need, beginning with His gift of salvation, or being completely forgiven, being born anew by Christ. Grace is not opposed to effort, but to earning. Is there biblical support for this? Of all the holy men of God that spoke as they were moved or borne along by the Holy Spirit, perhaps the Apostle Paul's confession best captures the principle expressed by Willard. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace toward me was not in vain. It wasn't wasted. It was not without results. On the contrary, I worked how? If you can read it, harder. I worked harder than any of them. Referring to the other apostles. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. And how often is that grace with us? 24-7. 24-7. God's free and supernatural provision is not opposed to human effort. Whether that effort is mental, emotional, physical, or volitional. As long as those energies are undergirded by what? God's amazing grace. However, we err when thinking our efforts will earn us additional grace. We don't want to go there. So why am I sharing this? Because we're going to need God's special favor today to process and profit from the message. We live in a world that in many respects is growing increasingly hostile to scriptural truth and to those seeking to honor the Lord Jesus. Christ followers are surrounded by a godless system arrayed against the principles and practice of biblical faith. Does that mean living for Christ in 2021 is no longer possible? Not at all. It is. If we'll rely on God's enabling grace while rolling up our mental, emotional, physical, and volitional sleeves. That's what we have to do. We have to put some effort in, but while we're lying on God's grace. Now, if you were out last Sunday, you'll recall our focus was on the source of our struggles, which in our search for truth, we identified as our hearts. Jesus was rather adamant. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. All right? I've given you a system to get rid of the things that aren't good for you and to keep what is. You are defiled by what comes from what? Your heart. Your heart. Evidence abounds regarding the veracity of his statement. All of us are guilty, whether in thought, word, or deed, of ignoring known laws, of breaching divine boundaries. But as debased as our fallen hearts are, a supernatural solution has been provided. A Savior has been born. What's His name? Jesus. And He's the only one capable of cleansing and controlling our corrupt hearts. If we'll hand them over. And that's a daily exercise. Lord, today I want to give You my heart, that locus of everything that makes me, me. But then what? But then what? Well, in response, consider this true or false statement. Once a repentant and believing sinner surrenders his or her heart to Jesus Christ, they should expect skirmish-free living filled with nothing but sweet experiences. True or false? False. You are correct. How do we know that? We know because there are three hurdles facing every Christian. The world, 
their flesh. And who's the third one? The devil. The same three obstacles responsible for intensifying the dark recesses of our hearts. Remember the Christian coach I highlighted last Sunday? In attempting to understand a transgender student, he asked me, where is this coming from? Why is this manifesting itself today? Well, in answer to his question, let's turn to 1 John and chapter 2. 1 John and chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible with you, we've provided a pew Bible, burgundy covered. You can join us as we read God's Word. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. John, of course, the apostle wrote the Gospel of John. And then he wrote his epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And so we're in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. And John says, do not love the what? World in general, or the things in the world in particular. If anyone loves the world, the love of or for the Father is not in him. Three different meanings are possible in reference to the world or cosmos as John uses the term. It can refer to creation. The world was made through him. John 1.10. It can refer to people. For God so loved the what? The world. The people in it. John 3.16. Or it can refer to an earthly system aligned against God and His kingdom. The world, actually the whole world, lies in or under the power of the evil one. 1 John 5.19. Another definition of the latter states that world is often used to describe the community of sinful humanity that possesses a spirit of rebellion against God. This third application is what John has in mind as he pens these verses. Ever since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, Satan, our adversary, has led an earthly system wholly opposed to God and contrary to His will. Since then, a cosmic or supernatural battle has been raging between what? Good and evil. Light and darkness. And guess who's caught in the middle? The church. Made up of those who have been called out of Satan's darkness and into Christ's marvelous light. Or as Paul expressed it, He, God, has delivered us. He's rescued us from the domain of darkness. And He's transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Who wants to say amen to that truth? Thank you. And yet, we still reside where? On planet Earth. Where we're surrounded by a system over which Satan, the prince or ruler of this world, reigns. So John pulls the proverbial alarm. Don't love the world's ways. Don't love the world's goods. Why, John? Because love of the world squeezes out love for the Father. How so? Look at verse 16. 1 John 2 and verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Taking a fancy to the world has always been incompatible with loving God because they constantly clash. Chronically clash. Who or what a person loves or shows affection for matters. So John is advocating for undivided allegiance. A, a heart that's headed in the right direction towards a timeless God rather than a temporary world dominated by the devil. That's what he's after. Look at verse 17. And the world is what? Passing 
away. It means to vanish, to cease to exist, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God, he who acts upon, who performs, who keeps on doing the will of God, abides forever, we could say, even into eternity. So it seems like a no-brainer, doesn't it? And yet, how often do we struggle to rise above the system controlled by Satan? We know the lust or desires of our flesh, the lust or cravings of our eyes, and the pride of life or self-exaltation are not of the Father. But still our hearts are drawn to pursue them. My heart is drawn to pursue them. Truth be told, the fact of our struggle validates the success of Satan's game plan. He's wily. Each of these avenues has proven its worth in captivating wayward or wrecked hearts. Lust of the flesh, pleasure or passions. I want to do that! Lust of the eyes, possessions. i got to have that! Pride of life, position, I'm going to be somebody. Remember Eve in the Garden of Eden? She saw that the tree was good for food. I want to eat that, lust of the flesh. That it was pleasant to the eyes. I've got to have that, lust of the eyes. A tree desirable to make one what? Wise. I'm going to be on par with God. That's what Lucifer's telling me. Pride of life. Fast forward to Jesus' New Testament temptation in the wilderness. Satan shows up to harass him. Going without food for 40 days. The Son of Man is hungry. The devil sees an opportunity. So he pulls out his playbook. It actually fits in his back pocket. Yes, he has a back pocket. Because all his hellish wiles are covered under three headings. Every one of his wiles under three headings to do. Hey, just command this stone to become bread. You'll be able to eat, to have, jump off the temple. You'll experience your father's intervention. You'll have that to be. Worship me and you'll be in charge. In a way, his strategy matches Coach Herman Boone's from Remember the Titans. Any fans? I'm talking about the movie Remember the Titans. Any fans? Oh, man, you're letting me down. Hopefully this will do better in the second service. This is what he says in the movie. If you haven't watched it, you need to watch it, especially if you're a sports nut. You're missing out. He says, I run six plays, split veer, like Novocaine. Just give it time. It always works. So what does the great dragon, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world... Know about humanity that he's been observing for quite some time. He understands our propensity towards or our susceptibility. I'm going to get it out. Our susceptibility to certain sinful behaviors, whether sensual, lust of the flesh, material, lust of the eyes. Or egotistical, the pride of life. Each of us, one of those three areas, is the tough nut for us. And Satan knows it. Drugs or drink, wine or women, riches or renown, food or fun, power or prestige. Take your pick. When abused, each pursuit becomes the external manifestation of what? A heart out of sync with God. And a mega horn for Satan's manual. It works. Blaise Pascal reached the same conclusion as recorded in his Ponzés. Did I say it correctly? I really worked on that one. It is in vain. He was a French mathematician. I think he wrote some. Uh, Yes, he did, because the Ponsais. He uh, was a Catholic theologian, but this is what he wrote. It is in vain, O men, 
that you seek within yourselves the cure for all your miseries. All your insight only leads you to the knowledge that it is not in yourselves that you will discover the true and good. The philosophers promised them to you, and they have not been able to keep that promise. Your principal maladies are pride, which cuts you off from God. And sensuality combines the lust of the flesh and eyes, which binds you to the earth. And this brings me back to the question posed by the Christian coach. Where is all this coming from? First, as summarized previously, our depraved hearts are the source of our struggles. And I quote, we are not sinful because we sin. We sin because we are what? Sinful. This means we're responsible for our actions. We are responsible for our attitudes. We're to blame for our wrongdoing. Second, God in His creative mercy and wisdom has granted us free will or the ability to choose. Why did He do that? I don't think I would have done that if I was making people to love me. I would have just pre-programmed them. Just do this. You don't get a choice. Not God. Why did He give us this choice? So we might love Him and each other willingly rather than under compulsion because we're being forced to. But included in His divine gift is the freedom to act upon whatever we're exposed to or to fulfill whatever our fallen hearts envision. We can do that. We can go there. And believe me, between the world, our flesh, and the devil, there is plenty to choose from. What do I mean? Well, if you're not aware, President Biden has declared June as the COVID-19 vaccine month of action. Did you know that? I mean, we're wanting to get it out there. But June is also the annual Pride Month for the LGBTQ community celebrated with public parades and events. Years ago, anyone connected with or considering this kept it behind closed doors. But no longer. Those doors have been busted wide open. What about folk who identify as heterosexual? They don't have a month designated for celebrating their preference, but doors have been opened there as well, living together. Rampant. Child trafficking. The sex trafficking. Pornography. They've become mainstream. Billion dollar industries. So here's my question. Are these matters of the heart due to biology? Or ideology? Or do they go deeper than that? What about wounded hearts? What about those wrecked by abuse or abandonment? What part do the sins of others play in the sins we struggle with? We can't just brush some of this stuff aside with these big broad brush strokes and say there's not something more at work here. The world certainly isn't a friend to what God has designated as true and wholesome. This is especially evident in the realm of human relationships and intimacy. Confusion reigns as society and young people today are bombarded with gender-sensitive pronouns. Equality math, equity housing, critical race theory. Did you know that Spain recently released equality stamps in their anti-racism effort? Equality stamps, they're skin-toned, ranging from shades of light brown to black. Our own U.S. State Department has its first-ever chief diversity slash inclusivity officer. That's been appointed. And what about our kids? Is the world's message invading their minds? It is. Nickelodeon produces a show target, targeting toddlers, one to three-year-olds, on such matters as environmental racism 
and social acceptance. The latter includes a cute little song along with non-binary cartoon dolphins and trans beavers. This is out there. Not to be outdone, PBS hosts a show for three to six-year-olds. In it, a drag queen in full regalia recites colorful stories promoting choices no three to six-year-old should ever be confronted with. And I'm just, this is just surface. There is so much more. I wonder how the devil or accuser of the brethren feels about all of this. He is a murderer from the beginning, declared Jesus, and the father of lies like the thief of John 10.10 who comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Satan is hell-bent on taking or tarnishing lives, especially children who can grow up as what? Followers of Christ. I'm going to wreck you so you'll never turn to Jesus. And who's the other one in his sights? Women, because they can have more children who can grow up to be followers of Christ. We prayed over the SB 835 bill passed by the Connecticut State Legislature, signed into law by Government Lamont, wrongly accusing care net centers of false advertising, not because they're guilty, but due to the bill's sponsors being anti-life. We don't want the competition. I'm sure the prince of the power of the air is pleased with its passage because he wants to silence the truth regarding God's gift of life. I want to take life. I don't want it preserved. I've got to shut you up. You wonder where the cancellation culture comes from? I think we know. And what about the world's relentless advertising campaign aimed at young, impressionable girls? What about that? Vince Vitale explains, models on billboards have not only been airbrushed and colored, but their very dimensions have been distorted. Why? To sell more products. So you can chase an image that is not biologically possible to achieve. In this consumeristic crossfire, self-image and self-worth are left fractured and insecure. And the results speak for themselves. The National Center for Health Statistics reported in April 2016 that suicide rose 24% in America between 1999 and 2014, a 30-year high. And it has tripled among 10 to 14-year-old girls. What is that stat today? Satan loves to deceive the unsuspecting, the vulnerable, the young, so he can destroy them. Jesus' warning remains in effect. The devil does not stand in the truth. There is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. So this demonic ruler mounts his assaults via the world and assails human hearts through what? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He latches on to any opening he can to dupe us into loving the world in general or in particular anything to dampen or diminish our love for God. I want to interfere. I want to conquer and divide. Or is it divide and conquer? That's how it goes. What can we do to counter these lies? I mean, are we just hopelessly left to whatever? We just got to put up the white flag? How might we avoid his traps? Well, for starters, heeding John's unspoken admonition would be a positive step. What did he say? Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. In essence, the antidote for loving the world is to have greater love for God the Father. God, today I want to put you ahead of these earthly things. And since loving God involves keeping His Word, here's a second step. Keep or guard your heart. That's mission control. With all vigilance above all else, for from it... Flow what? The springs of life. 
Where does life or real living begin? Right here. Every day, this is where it comes from. So how might we guard our hearts against the lust or desires of our flesh, the lust or cravings of our eyes, and the pride of life or self-exaltation? That's a great question. Let's answer it in reverse. In the realm of pride, Paul exhorted the saints of Rome, don't think you are better than you really are. Does anyone struggle with this? I do. I think I've got some pretty good things to bring to the table. And then life reminds me that you're not really as great as you think you are. Or Ellen does. <laughs> the message elaborates. Living then as every one of you does in what? Pure grace. It's important that you not misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing this goodness to God. No, God brings it all to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what He does for us. Not by what we are and what we do for Him. Don't you love that? If you want to avoid the lonely pit of pride, here's God's remedy. Here it is. When you do things, do not let selfishness or pride be your guide. Instead, be humble and give more honor to others than to yourselves. Did you see that last part? Oh, I don't want to do that because they're not more honorable. It's not, we're not giving a pass here. Giving honor to others more than to yourselves. In other words, replace self-exaltation with esteeming others. Lift them up. In the lust of our eyes or possessions arena, God's solution based on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is to become secret givers. Go covert, go black ops here and become a secret giver. Greed, greed is a stern taskmaster. One who is never satisfied, always wanting more what? It's an S word. Stuff. More stuff. But Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than to acquire. It is more blessed to give than to amass. It is more blessed to give than to accumulate. So we have a choice. His way or ours. Sharing or stuff. And lastly, what about the lust of the flesh? Those internal passions that are destroying so many marriages and so many minds. The lust of the flesh affects both sexes, but since it tends to be more problematic for men, I want to share a practical plan of action I heard once. First, from a proactive perspective, whenever external temptation stimulates internal yearning, look away. Look away. Look away, look away, look away. Make a song out of it, something, but look away. Second, from a reactive place, a reactive spot, let someone know. Break the power of the lie, the hold, by truth speaking. Let someone know. Don't attempt to fight it on your own because two are always better than what? One, there's nothing like having a brother standing with you in the trenches as you strive to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. In just a moment, we're going to partake of the Lord's table. We're going to play a final song. But before we do, I want to share a story about a university student in Chicago that Mr. Vitali interacted with. When asked, does God love you? He quickly responded, no. When asked why he thought that, he said, I'm a bad person. I do bad things. I think bad things. I have a bad personality. Imagine that. Can you identify with his confession? Anybody feel that way about yourself today? Vince writes, I asked him whether years from now, he would stop loving his child if that child began to think and do bad things. 
No, I wouldn't. I would continue to love him, he responded. I then made the simple connection. If God is a father and you are his child, wouldn't he continue to love you through both the good and the bad? He paused, his eyes filled with tears, and he responded, I guess that makes sense. Why does it make sense? Because God is love. He sent his sinless son, full of grace and truth, to bridge the gap that separates us from him. And the magnitude of his great love was fully displayed where? At Calvary. When Jesus paid the complete price for our sins, so we could be right with God. We could be restored to him. I don't know where you're at this morning or what you've done, what you're doing, or what you're thinking of doing, but I know the cross of Christ holds the answer. There Jesus did everything that needed to be done so we could experience a living relationship with our Heavenly Father. How do I know? Three powerful words. It is is finished. I'm glad that John gave us the Christian's bar of soap in 1 John 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. I don't need a whole bath. I just need to get the specks that show up on occasion and go to the Lord and say, Lord, I am sorry. And this this Lord's table is a time for us to do that, right? To invite the Holy Spirit to search our hearts and make sure that things are good between us and the Lord and between us and one another. And if there's something out of sorts, that's the time to confess and say, Lord, I need that cleansing. I, I want the fellowship restored. Not salvation, I have that. But I want the fellowship restored, the closeness. I don't want there to be this distance between us that I feel or between another brother or sister in Christ. And We all know about that too, don't we? When you're mad at somebody, you just you don't have to say anything. Well, usually you don't say anything, or maybe you do, but you just feel it. You know the wall's there even though it's invisible. And until I say, you know what, I was an egghead, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Yes. And then it just evaporates. It's gone. And we feel the same way when our, we're out of sorts with God. I said, Lord, I'm sorry. Satan got me again Lord I'm sorry clean it up I want to walk in victory does God work with that kind of prayer please everyone nod your head yes yes he does yes he does so Jesus said when he took bread and broke he said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me let's eat together And in the same manner, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. And God's people said, amen. Let's stand together and we'll close in prayer. Father, thank you that as your child through faith in Christ and the gift that only he can give, that's holy of grace, not of our effort other than receiving what he has accomplished for us through faith. Father, I thank you that we're on the winning side. I thank you that glory awaits. It's coming. But until then, we're here. And the system we're in is anti-God. So Lord, I pray in the week ahead that when the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life begins to draw us away from loving you, that we would say in that moment, Lord Jesus, I want to love you above all else. I want to love your 
Father. Dear Holy Spirit, enable me to do just that. Enable me to be a giver rather than an accumulator. Enable me to look away and to let someone know rather than diving in. Enable me, Lord, to esteem others better than myself. To take the, the low seat, the low place. And to let you do the exalting when you deem it appropriate. Not my own lips or my own heart. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you that we could remember Jesus, your sacrifice. Because apart from that, there's no hope. There's no answer. But Lord, I thank you that you came to heal wounded and broken hearts. You came to restore what the enemy wants to destroy. We give you praise today. Go with us as we leave this place. Bring us back in your will to the next fill in the blank. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming.